Greetings and welcome back to room 303. We turn now in your handles on page 815 to Sophocles' classic Antigone. Now, just to remind for your notes, background information. In the bigger picture, we have the tragic story of Oedipus. His father, Laius, king of Thebes, is predicted to be killed by his son, and his son is going to marry his own mother and have four children. They take the child out, leave him out on the mountainside. The child is found. He's raised in another town named Corinth. When he's at a party, he's told by a blind, blind prophet, dude, you're cursed. You're going to kill your dad and marry your mom. Oedipus, wanting to save that terrible thing happening, leaves Corinth. At the crossroads, he has a fight with a man who he does not realize is his father, the king of Thebes, Laos, and he kills him. He answers the riddle of the Sphinx, what animal walks on four legs in the morning, on, on uh, two legs at noon, on three legs in the evening. And um, for that, because he answers that it's a human, he gets to become the king of Thebes. He does not know that he has married, he killed his dad and married his mother. He then will have four children with his mother, two daughters, Antigone and Ismene, two sons, Polynices and Eutocles. By the end of the play Oedipus Rex, Three things for your notes have happened. One, Oedipus realizes he killed his dad, married his mom, and had four kids. Ugh. Not that he woke up some morning and said, yippee today I'm going to kill my dad, and marry my mom, and have four kids. No, 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 no. This is all done unawares. You have no idea of it. The way I've often said this is, you're at the party at college, you're lonely and bored, all of a sudden you meet this person, this person and you are immediately connected. Dude, you finish each other's sentences, you quickly fall in love, you get married, you have four children, two sons and two daughters. Your life is going amazing. You have made all kinds of money, you're incredibly rich and powerful, and then you get an email that says, when you were born, you were actually born a twin. And you were separated at birth. And your instincts are like, no way. Dude, I'm going to go do some research. What do you know? Your twin ended up at the same university where you ended up. What do you know? Your twin was the one at the party that night you met. And you've married your twin. By the way, for those of you that know your Star Wars, you know this is why Luke and Leia cannot be lovers. Because, of course, they're brother and sister. Right? Okay, this is a very ancient motif. In other words, the notion is Oedipus doesn't know he married his mother after he killed his father and had four children. Number two, at the end of Oedipus Rex, Oedipus will go into the bedroom to see his wife, Mother Jacusta. She has hanged herself in shame. So she's dead. Talk about your dysfunctional family, right? Oedipus will take the pins that are in her dress and he'll shove those pokey things into his eyes and he will blind himself. Note the irony. At the moment Oedipus goes blind, he can see. Understanding, sight, perspicacity, insight, right? Number three, at the end of Oedipus Rex, a broken man, Oedipus, his two sons have fled in shame. They're ready to start fighting against each other to debate who's going to run the kingdom because obviously they're sons of king, right? Ismene, the other daughter, has in shame gone away. And the only one left for Odysseus or for Oedipus is in fact Antigone. He is led off stage, and as he is led off stage, he asks the new king, who is the brother of Jacusta, don't try and get too, too much into the details of the family relations here, okay? The brother of Jacusta, which is obviously the uncle of Antigone, right? Oedipus says, Will you please take care of my four children? Creon makes a promise, I will, on one condition. You leave Thebes and never come back. Oedipus leaves and goes to a town called Colonus. There he will die. He will die with only the help of his daughter Antigone. Ismene is ashamed. Before he dies, Oedipus is told bad news. That's why we call these tragedies, right? Bad news. Your two sons, fighting against each other outside the walls of Thebes, killed each other. One, Eutocles, was supporting King Creon. The other, Polynices, he was not supporting King Creon. Oedipus, of course, his heart broken, dies. Our play will open. Now we're ready to take some notes. Our play Antigone will open with Antigone saying to her sister Ismene, 
we got serious problems. Creon the king has made a law, an edict, and here it is. Etocles was fighting to defend King Creon. He will receive proper burial. Polynices was not fighting to defend Creon. He will not receive proper burial. If anyone buries the body of Polynices, he will be stoned to death. The way they would stone you was put you in a hole that went right up to your shoulders. And then they would throw rocks. They had professional stoners, no kidding, who threw the rocks. They would not hit your head. They would hit your body. And of course, as the, as the rocks hit your body and fell into the hole, it filled up. Finally, when the rocks had filled up and you had been beaten badly with the stones, they would pick up a large rock, come over and drop it on your head. That was how you died from stoning. Antigone says to Ismene, if we bury the body of Polynices, we must die by stoning. Let's go bury Polynices' body. And Ismene is like, whoa, 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 wait, 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 what was the middle part? Ismene will say, we are women. Men make the rules. We just follow the rules. Antigone is fierce, defiant. She's like, yo, wimp, I'll do it myself. Now, burial of, body, of the body of Polynices doesn't mean burying them into the ground. It just simply means spreading some special kinds of libations over the body so that the body then can be properly escorted down into the underworld. The tension, write this down, the tension or the conflict of our play is simply this thing. Antigone believes that the gods will demand that she bury the body of Polynices, her brother. There is a law against it, but that is not the higher law. The higher law is God's law. That says you have to bury the body of your family members. And to that degree, our play then will unfold. Creon will be told about the burial of the body of Polynices. He will be outraged, and he will be even more shocked and stunned when he discovers it is his own family relation, Antigone, who has violated the law. Creon, of course, now has a problem. He made a rule, and now he's got to enforce the rule. Will he kill by stoning Antigone? Oh yeah, there's one other problem. Creon's son, Haman, and Antigone, they're lovers, soon to be married. And so we're going to have a powerful moment in this play. When Antigone defiantly will say to Creon, Dude, I don't care about your stupid laws. I buried my brother. I would do it again. You want to kill me, kill me. And she's led off stage. But when Haman, Antigone's lover and Creon's son, shows up, Haman says to his dad, We got to talk. We got serious problems. That will be the central conflict, really, of our play. When Creon and his boy go at it. At the end of the play, a blind prophet, Tiresias, will show up and say to Creon, What is wrong with you? You have done something terribly wrong. And our play will end, of course, in tragedy, because Creon will learn too late that when you make bad decisions and you don't follow justice, terrible things can happen. I'm with you on page 815. We will take our annotations now from the prologue through scene two. So we're going we're gonna to study consistently now prologue through scene two, as your textbook will provide it. Now some of this play is a little bit edited in terms, of the, in terms especially of the chorus, but we will work now specifically with the text that we have in front of us starting on A15. For each one of the sections, you want to have an annotation. So let's begin right away with the prologue. So write that down. This will be our first annotation on page 815. We will do an annotation over each of the different sections. Notice the prologue 815. That will, that will run notice until 818 where we have the parodos. Then we will have scene 1 on 819. And for each one of these, we will take some annotative work. Okay? Our goal here is to, of course, appreciate the language of Sophocles, obviously in translation uh, by Dudley Fitz and, and Robert Fitzgerald. Let's go to work now. We'll begin with the prologue and the exchange between Antigone and her sister. Let's enjoy. Antigone, prologue through scene two, by Sophocles, 
Translated by Dudley Fitz and Robert Fitzgerald. Scene, before the palace of Creon, king of Thebes. A central double door and two lateral doors. A platform extends the length of the facade, and from this platform, three steps lead down into the orchestra, or chorus ground. Time, dawn of the day after the repulse of the Argive army from the assault on Thebes. Prologue. Antigone and Ismene enter from the central door of the palace. Ismene, dear sister, you would think that we had already suffered enough for the curse on Oedipus. I cannot imagine any grief that you and I have not gone through. And now, have they told you of the new decree of our King Creon? I have heard nothing. I know that two sisters lost two brothers, a double death in a single hour. And I know that the Argive army fled in the night but beyond this, nothing. I thought so. And that is why I wanted you to come out here with me. There is something we must do. Why do you speak so strangely? Listen, Ismini. Creon buried our brother Idiocles with military honors, gave him a soldier's funeral, and it was right that he should. The Palinices, who fought as bravely and died as miserably, they say that Creon has sworn no one shall bury him, no one mourned for him, but his body must lie in the fields, a sweet treasure for carrion birds to find as they search for food. That is what they say, and our good Creon is coming here to announce it publicly, and the penalty, stoning to death in the public square. There it is. And now you can prove what you are, a true sister or a traitor to your family. Antigone, you are mad. What could I possibly do? You must decide whether you will help me or not. I do not understand you. Help you in what? Ismini, I am going to bury him. Will you come? Bury him? You have just said the new law forbids it. He is my brother, and he is your brother too. But think of the danger. Think what Creon will do. Creon is not strong enough to stand in my way. Ah, oh, sister, Oedipus died, everyone hating him. For what his own search brought to light, his eyes ripped out by his own hand. And Yocasta died, his mother and wife at once. She twisted the cords that strangled her life. And our two brothers died, each killed by the other's sword. And we are left. But, oh, Antigone, think how much more terrible than these our own death would be if we should go against Creon and do what he has forbidden. We are only women. We cannot fight with men, Antigone. The law is strong. We must give in to the law in this thing, and in worse. I beg the dead to forgive me, but I am helpless. I must yield to those in authority, and I think it is dangerous business to be always meddling. If that is what you think, I should not want you even if you ask to come. You have made your choice, and you can be what you want to be. But I will bury him, and if I must die, I say that this crime is holy. I shall lie down with him in death, and I shall be as dear to him as he to me. It is the dead, not the living, who make the longest demands. We die forever. You may do as you like, Eight, since 17. apparently the laws of the gods mean nothing to you. They mean a great deal to me, but I have no strength to break laws that were made for the public good. That must be your excuse, I suppose. But as for me, I will bury the brother I love. Antigone, I am so afraid for you. You need not be. You have yourself to consider after all. But no one must hear of this. You must tell no one. I will keep it a secret, I promise. Oh, tell it. Tell everyone. Think how they'll hate you when it all comes out. If they learn that you knew about it all the time. So fiery. You should be cold with fear. Perhaps. But I'm doing only what I must. But can you do it? I say that you cannot. Very well. When my strength gives out, I shall do no more. Impossible things should not be tried at all. Go away, Ismini. I shall be hating you soon, and the dead will too. For your words are hateful. Leave me my foolish plan. I'm not afraid of the danger, if it means death. It would not be the worst of deaths, death without honor. Go then, if you feel that you must. You are unwise, but a loyal friend indeed to those who love you. Exit into the palace. 
Antigone goes off left. Enter the chorus. All right, let's pause for a moment, write it down. Three things really quickly. In our opening, we learn three things. One, we meet Antigone, fiery, determined. She's got guts. We meet Ismen, her sister. She's afraid, she's timid, she doesn't know a lot. She doesn't want to know. She hasn't heard about this new edict. And when she says, uh, we are women and we can't break the law, she says a lot about who she is. Antigone is a lot like her father, Oedipus. She says, there is nothing about this law that I agree with, and if I have to die, I am willing to die. Notice it's Ismene that begins with the word suffering at the beginning of the play. And Ismene points out, our family is cursed. It's always been cursed. Notice Antigone. I love my family. I love my brothers. And I will do this thing. I do not care for the outcome. Write down really quickly what you want to say about Antigone already. Clearly, lots of courage. Clearly already, major theme at 2A introduced. That juxtaposition of doing the right thing versus the legal thing. Notice we've got a law that says you can't bury the body of Polynices, and then we have the right thing. You should have loyalty to your brother. Between the two, you'll remember in your freshman year when we did, when we did the Odyssey, and Odysseus has to sail through those two nasty monsters, Scylla and Charybdis. This is kind of where Antigone has got to go. On the one hand, there's the law that says you can't bury the body of Polynices. On the other hand, there's the understanding it's the right thing to do if you love your family and you love your brother. Notice Ismene, though, will say, I cannot go along with this, but I will keep it quiet. Notice Antigone. No, no, no. Tell everybody. I want everybody to know. She is defiant to the end. And to that degree, Antigone will represent in literature. Let's jot down in 2B. Antigone becomes the symbol of defiance. I do not care what the law says. I will do the right thing no matter what. In 3A, jot down, what is for you an exemplar of this type of courage? Do you have a person in mind already that represents this kind of defiant courage? Who is in film for you, or in video games for you, someone who represents that kind of stand-up right in the face of authority and says, no, I will not tolerate this kind of thing at all, right? We can think of Perseus from Greek mythology as a classic exemplar of this, right? And of course, all of the ancient Greek heroes had that. Our classic, of course, uh, uh, of this is Prometheus, the provider of fire. And Zeus tells Prometheus, no way. And Prometheus says, up yours, I'll do it anyway, to God. And for that, crucified on a rock and tortured. Finally, at 3B, jot it down already. You're into the play already. What, what would you do in a circumstance like this, where you know you're going to get executed for doing something for your family that you know is loyalty to your family? But if you do it, you get executed. Which is more important, your life or loyalty to your family? Which is more important, obeying the law of the government or obeying the law that you know is the right thing to do? You, we might say in Greek, in Greek to, um, understandings, it would be the law of the gods, okay? Now, we're going to meet for the first time our chorus, and we're going to hear our chorus speak back and forth about the challenges of what it means to be human. Now again, the chorus is going to give us some of the central themes of our play. Here we go, Parados on page 818. Let's go to work with it real quickly now. Parados, strophe one. Now the long blade of the sun, lying level east to west, touches with glory Thebes of the seven gates. Open, unlidded eye of golden day, O marching light across the eddy and rush of Dirce's stream, striking the white shields of the enemy, thrown headlong backward from the blaze of morning. Polynices, their commander, roused them with windy phrases. He, the wild eagle, screaming insults above our land. His wings, their shields of snow. His crest, their marshaled helms. Antistrophe one. Against our seven gates in a yawning ring, the famished spears came onward in the night. But before his jaws were sated with our blood, or pine fire took the garland of our towers, he was thrown back, 
And as he turned, great Thebes, no tender victim for his noisy power, rose like a dragon behind him, shouting war. For God hates utterly the bray of bragging tongues, and when he beheld their smiling, their swagger of golden helms, the frown of his thunder blasted their first man from our walls. Strophe 2 We heard his shout of triumph high in the air turn to a scream. Far out in a flaming arc he fell with his windy torch, and the earth struck him. And others, storming in fury no less than his, found shock of death in the dusty joy of battle. Seven captains at seven gates yielded their clanging arms to the god that bends the battle line and breaks it. These two only, brothers in blood, face to face in matchless rage, mirroring each the other's death, clashed in long combat. Antistrophe two. But now, in the beautiful morning of victory, let Thebes of the many chariots sing for joy. With hearts for dancing, we'll take leave of war. Our temples shall be sweet with hymns of praise, and the long night shall echo with our chorus. Okay, let's pause real quickly. Three things. One, the chorus is going to remind us that we are at the beginning of the day. By the way, this play will end in the afternoon, late afternoon, early evening. And in the process, we'll see that the play itself kind of follows a trajectory of morning to noon to tragedy in the evening. Number two, we hear about Polynices and his fight, and the chorus, speaking for the city of Thebes, says, Polynices got what he deserved. He was fighting against us, and therefore he is a villain. Number three, we learn here what we already know, and that is two brothers fighting against each other both kill each other. Now, of course, you can write this down real quickly at 3A. The most famous rendition of this...